I got to tell you, I am so excited. I'm so passionate about this idea of a digital only expression of church, a church that exists in digital space, a church that meets the biblical standard digitally without a physical footprint. That honestly, whenever I meet somebody who's as excited as I am about this topic, it's a big deal. And and I got to tell you, here with the Roths, they are that type of person. So Jared and Ann have been uh, uh, friends. I would call them family uh, here with the Church Digital. Like they are as close as it gets. Jared and Ann are are co pastors of, of a church up in the Pacific Northwest. But the conversation really isn't about that. You see that this couple, closer to retiring age than not, have have launched and have created a a research company, a research project centered around this idea of a digital expression of church. Now, it's a five-year project. They started this initiative in here in 2021. Uh, we, myself, the Church Digital, Stadia Church Planning as well, have been very involved in the creation of, of this project, or at least in resourcing them with churches to start this, this conversation. And I'm excited to tell you, after 2021, after the one year, the first year of this project, we're starting to get some of the findings in. And, and the findings are really exciting. Some of this stuff I knew, some of the stuff I've been saying for a while that, hey, this is the way it is. And it's great to get that validation. And some of the stuff, honestly, was a little bit of a surprise. We'll talk about it here in, in the podcast. But if you are wrestling with what does digital discipleship look like across the country? What is a digital only expression of church? How can we really look at a digital mindset, physical and digital working together? How, what are some other churches doing in this space? You're going to love this podcast because it really digs deep into that the understanding of what churches, physical churches, as well as digital only expression of churches, what are they doing in this digital space? So, for the conversation, I'm bringing in Jared and Ann Roth, call them founders of this organization called Sprout Digital, and myself, Jeff with the Church Digital and Stadia Church Planting, uh, in a conversation that I'm calling Research and Findings on Digital Churches. Okay, everybody, here you go. And Jared, and I love the stuff that's coming out of Sprout Digital. Why Why did you get involved in, in research? Why digital church planting? What what problems were you seeing that you're trying to solve here? Well, first of all, the digital church planning, the real decision behind that was that we have a lifelong passion uh, for church multiplication, church planting, and digital plants are the front wave. They are the new frontier. They're the new front door, if you will, um, into people's lives, um, wherever they're at. And so um, we thought of what contribution could we make, these two high mileage units, that would really help um, them. They are making the map for others. They're not using a map in these digital planting. And so we thought, well, they're building a bridge uh, without, uh, while well, they're walking on it. And that means there's going to be wrong turns and dead ends. And um, why don't we learn from their experience? That's something we could do is, um, is do research to evaluate their experiences and see what the full discipleship pathway looked like. Yeah, one of the, uh, the, it's not a unique contribution, but it's unusual in this space of leading edge church planning and being passionate about that uh, is that we have some research skills and expertise uh, experience with that. We really have a high regard for well done research that can stand up under the, under the rigors of people that really care about that stuff, looking at, looking at it in terms of its rigor and, and, uh, um, the results that are trustworthy. So we thought, well, if we, if we mend our passion and our experience and our love for the future and research skills all together, well, it just kind of emerged out of the middle of that. We said, you know, we want to do research in digital church planting. And we, we asked the question, uh, in a five-year run, what's, what's a big five-year question that probably will take that long to answer and that probably uh, needs to be answered in five years? And so this is the one we came up with. This is what Sprout Digital is solely about. And the question uh, that we want to answer is, Given a digital planter's platform and target, what model or models has God already demonstrated 
he effectively uses to fulfill a whole discipleship pathway in that platform. We think that as God calls more and more people to plant churches, that they will hugely benefit from uh, some at least rough maps drawn by people that have gone before. We want to be the folks gathering that information and sketching out that map. Well, I got to tell you, I don't know that you could have picked a more controversial subject within like the, the church realm today. I mean, just within the time of this recording, within the past week, championing the idea of digital expressions of church, uh, I've been called uh, the uh, the the bringer of the Antichrist, uh, seed of Satan, uh, has also been used in context of me. YouTube is not a nice place. I just I, I want to tell you. And uh, but anyway, it's it's been it's been fascinating to me, especially in the Western Church, uh, how how controversial. This idea is and how people are so, um, you know, I, I don't want to be judgmental, but so stuck on the, the building and see importance on that as opposed to maybe some of the other things that are, are highlighted more biblical, no judgment here. But it just it feels like we're, we're kind of forgetting some of that stuff. Did, did you as you've you know, I know we'll get into the research and talking to digital pastors and that's like lobbing a softball, I would imagine. Like that's that's probably a more safer audience. But as as you're as you're talking to, you know, um people that are interested in funding or other church leaders or even like at a conference just casually talking with people, like have you have you had much people like on board with this? Has there been tension where where people aren't seeing that maybe what have what's some of that experience been like for you it's so funny jeff and of course yeah, it's your, your experience uh let me just give this fun little story uh, i met last week with one of our major funders and he not only made a commitment early to fund he put up matching funds he fulfilled the commitment he has also already committed into next year into the second project he has also said after the first to do after he makes that significant contribution, there's likely another one in next year. Obviously, he is all in in terms of his support. He's been listening to us for a year. And finally, last week over coffee, he said, now I think I get what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> It is going to be a five-year research project. It's going to take five years to make it happen. And that's evidence right there. That's beautiful. So frankly, we have been rather discreet about the people that we have bothered with this idea. Uh, we, we know that we are studying innovators. And on the distribution of innovation curve, there aren't even early adopters in view yet let alone the late adopters, but the laggards are out in force. And so you only have two groups of people to talk to. You've, you've got the innovators and you've got the laggards. Uh, there's no way to bridge that gap. Uh, maybe in five years we'll get closer. But in the meantime, this is highly controversial in part because I think it is as transformational as the Reformation. Uh, God has always used technology. That's been controversial. The first uh, century, the gospel uh, exploded through the Roman Empire in 60 years using, in part, technology. Unprecedented Roman road system, unprecedented uh, uh, international, for them, language of commerce, Greek. The Reformation, of course, was associated directly with the new technology, the printing press. I believe that this is a season of the reformation of the church and it is primarily not a theological or ecclesiastical issue. It is primarily a technology issue. And that the technology is the disruption. And it's going to, to, to be a wonderful disruption in terms of the gospel and the mission being accomplished. And, and honestly, it's really a matter of, there's vision casting going on because it is about the future. It isn't all here yet. The map isn't made. There's not a track record that you can point to, which is one of the beauties of doing the research is to get the word out more broadly. So I call it being sweetly relentless when it comes to the vision. And I think the two parts, one resource, the research provides data and that moves some people. And the research also is providing narratives and narratives help people put flesh and blood on what we're talking about. Something that's really unimaginable to a lot of people, um, particularly after having gone through COVID um, and the 
forced use of technology um, for connection. Some people thrived on that, but some people reacted and are now pushing back at the idea of digital church. But just in our own church, as we share the vision, we found both that having data helps some people get on board and having a narrative or two, being able to flesh that out. Real human beings are behind this. Real people's lives are being changed and transformed by Jesus. So I think the more research we can do will help those who are forging that path, writing the map, drawing the map. Yeah, whatever image you use there. I, I, I love it. Yeah, and the ability to use that data to tell some of those narratives, uh, to, to try to sway. You know, oftentimes I, I say, and it's a Henry Blackaby quote back from Experiencing God, before I was born, uh, look and see where God is moving and pray about joining him in, in his work. And, and you guys have literally become the mouthpiece, at least step one of a five-year plan towards uh, championing the idea, hopefully championing, assuming the data holds up, uh, of uh, digital uh, expressions of, of church. So, hey, let, let, let's get into it here. What, what was this process? Like, so who did you talk to? How did you talk to them? Like, how did you gather this data, at, at least for step one here? Excellent. And, you know, this, was, this is, uh, is, is going to be uh, brief, but it's really important in, uh, from our point of view uh, because, again, we wanted to produce a product that was credible enough, for example, for doctoral students that are right now beginning to do their research in this space, for them to have some kind of literature to report to. Uh, we did not make this an academically designed project in terms of its presentation, but it is academic, has academic rigor in terms of how we put it together. So just briefly on that, and for some of, for some of your uh, listeners, they're going to really appreciate this. Um, with Jeff's help, thank you. Um, we identified 49 churches to invite to participate in the project. Uh, many of those were fidgetal churches, uh, physical and digital. And some of those, as many as we could identify, were digital-only church planters. So we'll talk about fidgetal and digital only. Each participant that chose to participate, and by the way, uh, these folks are, uh, are hungry for friends. We had a 65% return rate of invitations to participants. Uh, if you're doing research with pastors and you get 20%, you thank God many times over. Pastors do not participate in these kinds of projects. It was an astounding response, and it re required a significant commitment. Each of the participants was interviewed uh, by Zoom for an hour across a wide range of uh, personal context, ministry topics, uh, asked about their personal life, church background, their perceptions of church and leadership and digital church evangelism and discipleship and benefits and risks and church oversight and management. Sounds like a mess. It was intended to be a mess because all of these questions were not testing a hypothesis. We're not smart enough to have hypothesis to test. There was no null hypothesis. We are smart enough to know that God is doing something new and innovative, and if we ask enough questions and stimulate enough conversation, that good stuff will emerge out of it. And that, that is an approach of, of uh, research called grounded theory. When you don't know what questions you're asking, you just stir up the ground and see what emerges. And out of those interviews, all of them then were uh, transcribed. All of the phrases were coded. Then those phrases were analyzed statistically, and we saw what emerged out of it. And the discoveries that we have in this first of five projects is what emerged to the surface out of these conversations with digital and digital pastors. And what we were really after in this first one run was, can we discover some new models of digital church? Can we discover some new uh, discipleship pathways? In digital spaces, can we find begin to find some best practices? And and then because of our interest in emotional intelligence and how that's so directly affected to a leader's effectiveness, beginning to establish an EI database for both digital pastors and digital planters. Yeah, and I, I want to get into the to the EI just for clarification because the audience EI explain what that is. Emotional intelligence, and probably uh, most of your viewers are familiar with that. There's three major streams. All of them are legitimate, incredible. Uh, the one we use is called the EQI, the Emotional Quotient Inventory, comes from Baron's theory and work. Uh, we use that tool because it's the one that is most highly associated with effective professional and occupational life. 
and uh, other areas of ministry have been profiled in terms of EI profiles to those roles. We hope to establish that uh, eventually with uh, planters in the digital space. Audience, in case you haven't figured this out, you will be smarter listening to this podcast episode. We are we are elevating the notch of academia and educational understanding in here just talking about EI and EQI. I'm, 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 in, I'm in love with this. Okay. Hey, look, so you, you mentioned digital, digital only. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, digital only has a, a special place in my heart just because of the sheer disruptive nature of these types of people and the backlash that they get within the uh, within some of the church community, I don't want to overstate, but there are some people that that are, are against the idea. Uh, but digital, you know, obviously, so many churches took a hard left in in this COVID season and are trying to figure out the, the balance of that. So maybe just even looking at those two, digital uh, pastors, digital only pastors, is is this like a really apples to apples comparison? Are there differences between uh, a a digital pastor in a existing physical church versus a planter that's going completely separate. What were, what were some of the similarities and differences that you ran into? Yeah, I think um, that we see it as, as apples to oranges, really. Uh, both are fruits, uh, but you harvest a little differently. You know, they're both committed to digital connection and engagement, and they're passionate about making disciples as the mission of the church. Um, they even have similar views about what defines a church. They pretty much agreed that a church uh, could take many forms and many structures, but it had to meet the activity uh, criteria that you see in Acts 2, 42 through 47. Um, they're equally committed to a biblical discipleship pathway, and all of them believe that different skills are required for digital ministry. They actually agree about that, um, even though they're in two different realms. So if we had them all in the same room and we were discussing those topics, uh, they would all love each other in hugs and kisses. Uh, if we brought up these following differences, uh, we we'll probably will have an ecclesiastical war. <laughs> for example... Uh, as persons, digital planters have a broader range of emotional intelligence profiles. We don't know enough about that to say a lot about it, but I cannot wait for three or four or five years when we have a larger data set. What we do know is uh, we know what uh, what effective lead pastors, uh, senior pastors uh, profile out as. We, we have a lot of information about staff members. And most, not all, but most of the fidgetal pastors uh, are in a, in, a, in a church context with multiple staff, and they, they serve out of that context on the digital side. Uh, just, uh, just briefly, in, in this first round, those pastors tended to have a fairly common emotional intelligence profile. And in contrast, <laughs> the digital-only pastors have extremely different profiles. And we can't wait to flesh that out because we think that probably those profiles are not so much going to be associated with success in general, but success particularly within the platform and the target audience that God has called them to serve. So we're going to put that on the shelf for now, but these folks from an EI perspective are falling out into very different distributions in terms of EI profile. Uh, we thought that might be the case. It's frankly fun for me to see emerge because the implications are many more people can be engaged in starting and leading churches than may have been able to be engaged in our platform-driven kind of church that we've done in the physical setting in the past. Uh, another difference is um, digital planters, uh, they believe to their core that the entire discipleship pathway can be accomplished online. And almost to the person on the digital side, there is disagreement with that notion. And the belief on the digital side that at some point in the discipleship pathway, individuals must connect face to face in some kind of form of physical community. Uh, similarly, the physical uh, pastors tend to be part of physical church staff. And so they're associated with the relational and institutional support of that context. In contrast, our digital pastors, we found some highly independent, somewhat isolated, generally not very encouraged by other church leaders in their venue. 
No wonder they responded to the research project. They got to have a conversation with someone that was nice for an hour. That's uh, one of the other observations just on their differences, uh, a personality measure, extrovert, introvert. Um, and again, we haven't studied enough, a larger sample base to know for certain, but the percentage of introverts that are in the digital space is much higher uh, than it is in the in-person space. And it's a mix in the in-person, we know that, but um, the digital planters uh, tend toward introversion. That has been something that I've noticed, um, you know, and, and I have an unscientific, I just, as people approach me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm able to meet them or even approach Stadia and I'm able to engage with them. But by, by and far, it's been far more of an, uh, of an introvert or, or the not, you know, Stadia uses the term catalytic leader, the man who's, or woman, excuse me, who's capable of standing literally on a physical platform, platform behind the podium and, communicate and lead hundreds and thousands of people. The typical digital planter is not that type of person. And um, it, I love the fact that you found that because I get to say I was right. And it's very rare in life that I can say those words. And I'm saying them right now because because I've got Sprout Digital backing me up that that's saying I, I, I was right. So well done. All, all the effort paid off just in, in that in that one one little factoid right right there. Well, any, anything else to look at at this point? I just might mention this, Jeff, uh, as it relates to that, that profile, if it emerges, uh, just like the, the great work that Stadia does uh, in the, uh, the assessment discovery process now, uh, it's the experience of many, many others that have gone before that has allowed this, these data sets and these indicators to emerge so that, that now Stadia and that environment can provide an excellent assessment process because they know a whole uh, group of criteria that they are assessing against. And it's very possible that we're going to discover that, sa that same kind of uh, knowledge uh, on the digital side. And again, that's why we are platform and target specific. It's down to that granular level because obviously there are many platforms and there are many target audiences. But want to be a great thing for selection, training, and coaching of digital church planners for the future uh, if we can say God tends to use this kind of person in this kind of space. And if you use this kind of uh, idea or model, it might increase the likelihood that your church will actually accomplish the entire discipleship pathway. That'll be such an interesting conversation and, and just as we're examining into the future. Well, let's dig in a little bit here. I mean, we, we said discipleship pathway uh, a, a little bit. You're, you're going to love this. I, I, I love this question. Uh, you interviewed dozens of pastors. Uh, and, and so you probably have dozens of different perspectives of what discipleship, uh, of what disciple making is really about. Was there, is there a common theme or standard like on this engagement pathway, this discipleship pathway? What were elements that really stood out? Digital, digital only? Come, what were some of those perspectives? Well, one of the things is that uh, it it favors it doesn't favor high control. It favors a it's a democratized delivery, uh, and uh, because of that, so you you've got to be okay with that, um, not having to have the one, but the many uh, put it, putting in content and uh, interacting with your uh, material in the moment. And as we know, everybody's not used to that. <laughs> They're not Jeff Reed. <laughs> um, and then uh, secondly, being comfortable in the digital space. That's different than uh, being highly skilled in the digital space. And that distinctive is important because it's about being comfortable because when you share, you don't want to evoke anxiety. That's not the in speaking and sharing and uh, asking questions. So that's what I mean by being comfortable in the digital space. They do not have to be an expert in all things digital. You can get a team for that. You can put the people around you to do that, just like an in-person pastor does with a different set of skills. The third is uh, communicating um, in digital formats is different in that there's uh, you don't get the immediate feedback of an audience other than the posting that you get, but you don't get the facial expressions. There's, there's a whole lot that you're not going to see in the digital format, particularly maybe on these gaming platforms and some of that. So communicating in digital formats, being able to stand and deliver without a lot of um, extra 
um, things around you. Uh, and then the interaction, um, responding quickly to interaction. Not everybody. Some people are more reflective and other people um, are very immediate and being able to give feedback. And it favors the person who can be more immediate and giving feedback who's not as, I, I have to stew on that for a while. Of course, you can, everybody has some issues like that. But in general, there are people who are more reflective versus the more immediate. And this favors the more immediate person who can doesn't mind just, you know, throwing out that piece again, that li- little less controlled. You know, I think uh, one of the common themes uh, in, in continuing on with some of your ideas there, and uh, have to do with what we often call teaching. Uh, that, again, this is a very blunt overgeneralization. But generally speaking, the folks in the fidgetal side uh, had uh, had a little narrow, narrower view of or a, a set of problems that they were dealing with in terms of the different skill set and teaching. So ideas like um, you have to look at the camera, you're going to rely less on physical gestures, you can't move around as much, you're not getting immediate audience impact uh, 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 feedback. Um, those are obvious important skill sets to learn. But when you move over into the digital only space, it, it arises uh, a whole new set of issues arise. Uh, and of course, communicating effectively on different platforms is changing, you know, almost weekly. So it was, you know, just, you know, uh, days or weeks ago that TikTok changed from its uh, one minute now to three minute format. But in the research that's done, if you want to have maximum impact on TikTok, it needs to be nine to 15 seconds. Uh, you can stream for multiple hours on Facebook. You can upload video for two hours, but the most effective, optimal Facebook videos are 13 seconds to three minutes. Uh, so uh, the platform is uh, um, so um, shaping in terms of uh, the kind and the manner and the length of the content, how that content is delivered, how it's going to be accepted. Uh, and again, uh, when it comes to delivering information, communication is two-way. It has to be received. <laughs> and and uh, this probably, in my opinion, from the research, is going to be a major issue that has been underappreciated. What does teaching look like? What does the delivery of biblical content and life wisdom look like in these various platforms? Yeah, and that makes for a, a season of awkwardness a little bit because the church that's used to controlling all of their environments in physical space is now forced to, hey, we're going to have to release some control here. And, and, and I really want to preach that 40-minute sermon, but that is not going to be effective if I'm streaming it on Facebook. And so now organizations like Meta and TikTok are, are really starting to define what discipleship looks like on their platforms. And, and how are we, the church, are, are we comfortable reshaping some of, of what are, are and, and let's, let's not call it a biblical directive. 40-minute sermon is not biblical, but are we comfortable reshaping that? Uh, and, and so it's, yeah, I mean, this is why people are, are happy to talk about this stuff because, and I'll just tell you, when I was a digital pastor, and, you know, when if I brought that up in a staff meeting, I, I, I would either get laughed at, I would get stared at, or I would be told, stick around after the meeting, I want to talk with you directly. Uh, you know, and I've had enough of those conversations in my life that I, I know, like, it's it's hard to be um, innovative, bleeding edge, um, you know, an, an innovator in, in this in the season, especially when everyone else that you're working with, you know, and I, forgive me for speaking out of turn, but maybe a little bit on the laggard side. And, and so, um, you know, guys that are out there that are championing this, I, I, I love what you're doing, keep doing it, uh, and, and figure out how to to do it well, let's 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 talk here i mean even even to pivot a little bit here and take a step back so you know discipleship we talked about uh the missiologic the missiology of this the the digital as a mission field it, it's funny like even in conversations with digital pastors i know uh the digital only guys or i would suspect this the digital only guys are far more aggressive on the mission field of digital than maybe some of the digital guys that are used to you know, people coming to them instead of going after. What 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 did you find just overall within evangelism, within uh, digital as a mission field approach? So the the mission's the same for the physical or digital. They all agree on that, right? The Great Commission, Matthew twenty eight, uh, and talking about that. But in terms of uh, practices, yes, I think that what the research so- showed is that there's more. Um, 
initiative, more work done on the uh, evangelism side. So, for instance, uh, studying Twitter um, and looking for the what's trending on Twitter and then developing provocative questions, um, literally to pull people out of the woodwork, if you will, <laughs> out of cyberspace and get them to start talking and that being an initial link um, or being on a gaming platform and solely for the purpose of playing the game with other gamers and then in that to start uh, talking about your life, uh, just sharing a line or two here or there, but at the end to say, hey, Anybody want to just uh, talk about their story? You need someone to listen to you? Here's my contact info. And that's starting or offering to pray for them at the very end of the whole gaming uh, time together. Just saying, hey, if I can pray for any of you, just let me know. Here's my, you know, here's my contact info. And literally that beginning conversation after conversation with people who were willing because they go in an anonymity uh, in that regard um, to that person. And so um, that's, it, it's wonderful that way. Um, the missiology and ecclesiology were similar amongst our participants. And that we expressed that earlier when he said the criteria in Acts 2, 42 through 47, they all really agreed that's, that it's not the form or the structure of the church. Um, it is the activity, what they do, what they accomplish together. And if you can do what they did next to 42 through 47, then, uh, then that's a great church. Um, the physical and digital pastors generally believe that the ends of the earth includes all communities, right? Geographic, linguistic, generational, cultural, ethnicities, um, all of that. And now in those digital spaces, now, digital spaces are the new ends of the earth. I'm not sure everybody was convinced in the study. Uh, the digital pastors struggled to believe that um, they think evangelism can be accomplished, but they struggled to believe that you can disciple in a digital space. You can evangelize, but, but discipling was harder for them to grab hold of because of the in-person nature of what they do. So... Um, Digital pastors had no trouble believing that the incarnation includes that God can transcend um, for the sake of his kingdom. He can transcend um, our uh, cyberspace, any space that's put in front of him. Um, and new social formations can happen in any of those spaces because of that for the gospel. So, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much what the study showed. It, it'll be, I mean, I'm, I'm so glad you're doing a five year because it's, it, I mean, it's going to take a, a while. I cannot wait for you to, to open up globally and, and, and start to bring in some insight. Uh, some of, some of the stories, some of the conversations of, of what, and once again, uh, non scientific, just casual, uh, research, if even that, just Zoom calls. Tell me what's going on. Some of the stories that I hear of, of how God is using digital in a global space is almost embarrassing. Uh, that, that we at the U.S. are, are asking. I actually, I had a, I had a global missiologist tell me once, Jeff, your view of digital is too small. Honest to God, that was his quote. And, 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 and I'm like, do you not understand what I fight here in the U.S.? And you're telling me I'm thinking too small? Really? And, and it's, it's so I cannot wait as, as this expands and we, and we look at, at more global what's happening and how digital is influencing and how some of those influences, uh, you know, heaven forbid could even come in and influence us here, uh, in, in the West. Uh, it, it's going to be, uh, an exciting time. Well, Hey man, what other, we, we talked about some specifics here with discipleship and, uh, digital as mission field and some things there, but, um, what are some other findings? Like what, what's something interesting that maybe you guys ran across here, uh, when, when doing the study, you know, one of the digital plans, I mean, I, when we first talked about the digital, I mean, I'm an extrovert. I was one of those people thinking, how are you going to accomplish the whole mission, the whole discipleship pathway? Um, and this personal care issue, how are you going to take care of somebody who's, you know, had somebody die? Um, and how are you going to get close? And I mean, one of the digital plants, they had somebody who needed help moving. I mean, that's a pretty hands-on thing, right? That's as physical as you get. And they actually found somebody else who's part of the church in that region of the country. And this was across the country from Arizona to the East coast. 
and they um, found somebody else who was participating in the online plant, the digital plant, and um, they drove there, rented a U-Haul truck, and helped this person move the hundred miles or so that they were going to move and were the, you know, basically hands of Jesus and the rest of the church uh, gave money to help with the cost of the move. Again, just a very caring thing. And they figured out a way to do it. Um, another one had, you know, a lot of people mentioned what about in grieving and they had a small group in their digital plant that was meeting in a city that was, you know, 500 miles North of them. And that group, um, was in the same town as this person um, that they came into contact with that needed this uh, to for someone to be by them in their loss. And they went to them and uh, surrounded them, loved them. And um, I mean, that woman became a part of the digital plant because of it, because this was somebody just in their community who went online looking for help. So I think that um, it's interesting to see the stories emerging of how you can bridge the gap in different ways. And it'll be fun to see more of those. Yeah, love that. Let's talk findings. Excited about that. Everyone says that they're committed to making disciples, uh, but very few of them are comfortable yet with their actionable definition of that. Um, So the discipleship pathway is still, um, the the digital planters um, have their own, not doubts, but they are humble. They acknowledge we haven't arrived yet there. We, we still don't know all the parts. Basically, we're making the map and we're still figuring this out. So um, the, being able to say this is how it will all work out. They don't have that yet, but they are working on it, and it's it's totally their intention. And then as we listen, we usually hear uh, some variation on Jesus' call to Peter to be a fisher of men, to follow Jesus, to be transformed by Jesus, and to join Jesus on his mission. So there's that common theme of, you know, a disciple um, and what a disciple is. Um, But the project did identify three major differences in perspective between the digital and the digital. Well, uh, let me just highlight some things that, uh, that emerge that are, are real concerns. Um, there's significant uncertainty about what to measure and how to measure. And uh, conversation about uh, metrics that might be helpful for the future. But, uh, but frankly, I had hoped that more would emerge in this study. Uh, so this is obviously an area that people uh, are really thinking about working on and needing some help with. What is it that we measure and how do we measure and what does that mean? I think what it's, uh, what it's disclosed is that probably many of our metrics that we've been comfortable using in the physical church uh, up until two years ago probably weren't very good KPIs, but we were comfortable using them. We developed norms around them. Uh, probably didn't indicate for many of our churches, we'll speak about our own, for example, that really helped us know if people, if disciples were being made. So frankly, I think the whole church is revisiting uh, the metric issue. Um, a second thing that we discovered was nobody's cracked the code on serving children and youth and and adults. Uh, the family as a unit in the church in a digital space uh, is is just, there's experiments. It's It's early, early in the process. And particularly when it comes to children, uh, there's the possibility of creating some great programming for children. In fact, a you know, wonderful, wonderful church in Roblox that is my kids for kids. But having said that, that's uh, monogenerational. Uh, the real issue with uh, creating stuff in children's space is safety. And how do you monitor that? How do you vet people? Uh, you're 24-7 in that environment. And uh, so some real challenges there. That music uh, uh, is so tough that people almost laugh when you ask them about it. It's not difficult to provide the production of music, but it is certainly difficult to engage people on the other side of the screen in participating using the art form of music to express worship to God. And uh, who knows where we'll go with this one, but maybe we'll revert back a few hundred years ago where music was a, but not necessarily the primary art form that churches used collectively in worship. And we're excited to see what other kinds of art forms uh, and practices will emerge in the digital space that will actually engage people in a spirit and in a soul, in an emotional uh, and even physical way in ways that music apparently is not going to translate as it does uh, in the large physical space. 
that's really good. That's really obvious. That is the maybe the major pain point I think with digital church and physical is because at least in broadcasting the services, so much of worship has been you know limited, restricted back to that physical that you know musical expression. And yes, coming from a guy who's literally produced tens of thousands of worship services in his life, you know, give me a haze machine, give, give me some, give me some moving lights, uh, give me a couple subs on the floor. Yeah, I, I can get the spirit of God falling in that room, and, and whether he's actually there or it's just a, a well-produced service, that's not me. That's not mine to say, and I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm just running the show here. Um, but yes, there, there is an opportunity to, to, and this is really why we talk about how digital is different. We can just keep doing what we're doing physically, digitally, and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but there, there's certainly some issues that, that'll pop up. But maybe, and, and this is, I'll, I'll be honest, and, and, and Roth, I've, you know, I've had this conversation with you. I, man, like when we talk about digital-only church, I mean, the, the possibilities of what this is, the organic nature of, of what it can be, um, I, I, I think biblically it aligns maybe a little closer if we're really looking at that Acts 2 church, maybe I think we're actually able to do some of that better in digital space than even what what the physical church has evolved to. And this is why a lot of people call me the son of Satan and, and seed and Satan and all that. Cause, cause, oh my gosh, I just, you know, said something, you know, negative and disrupting. But, but part of this is, I almost wonder if we're using, like, I, I wish we could come up with another word. I make up words all the time, but like I, I hesitate to call digital church church sometimes because at least here in the Western Civ, there's so much perception, there's so much preconceived notions of what church is. And it's not based on Bible, it's based on opinions and tens and hundreds and, and even a thousand years of, well, that's just the way that it's been, but that's not the way that it was. And, and so it's I don't know what I'm I'm, I'm rambling on to a bunch of researchers. So I don't know what I'm looking for question wise, but man, I feel that tension right now when I'm looking at, at what the digital church could be and, and some of that tension of, of how do we even start to swing the pendulum that way, maybe away from what a physical model is to at least a different expression of that. You know, I think, uh, I think that it's so easy for us to sanctify the model. Um, and then when you talk about the model, as this neutral thing that may or may not be of service, that that it feels like you're attacking something that's sacred. Uh, my view, probably not the prevailing view about much of anything, including this, but I have always viewed uh, the incarnation of Jesus extending into not just the human form of the body of Jesus, but into human forms. So my belief is that the incarnation has come to dwell in us and among us for transformation. And so I believe that that Jesus, even coming as a Jew in that Christmas story environment, is coming into human forms and using those human forms for kingdom transformation. He used the the synagogue service for kingdom transformation, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we, for many years now in the West, at least, have used the small business model to the medium business model as the structure of our form. And we're organized legally and organizationally around the small business model. I think that that's brilliant. Uh, I don't think that that is um, uh, disparaging anything. Uh, the church is not the small business model, but if that's the pro- predominant form and how people co- connect and collect in culture around business and education, we use those forms for kingdom purposes. God comes in those forms. He meets us there. He meets us and, re- and uh, re- redeems us and transforms us personally. He also comes into other human forms and and does transformation within the culture. So the question is, how is the small business model changing? Well, it's changing into our our buying practices and our commerce into digital spaces. So to me, it is a neutral observation that as culture shifts how it connects and collects, that the church will flow with those new forms incarnationally and the gospel will flow through and into those forms for kingdom purposes. So again, uh, it's highly disruptive. Uh, it disrupts our, our norms. It disrupts our economies of scale. It disrupts our budget. It disrupts how people are chosen and prepared for vocational ministry. 
Uh, the, the economics at this point are not encouraging on the physical side. Fewer people give, people that give, give less. It means uh, makes significant economic issues for what new forms are going to be uh, emerging. Co uh, vocationality is probably going to be uh, the norm. And then again, some would look at that and say, thank God that we're actually looking more like things did. Uh, maybe we've been praying to, to be like the New Testament church, and maybe this is a pathway that's actually disturbing and disrupting us toward that, uh, that freshness. It's, that's beautiful. There's so much, so much change that, that's opening up if we, if we just give it, um, give it fresh eyes. Uh, and, and, and I really do believe that, I mean, the church that you described, I mean, really starts to lay the foundation for the church of the future. Uh, you know, within, within Stadia, uh, probably within established churches, planting established churches, 25% of the conversations we're having right now are with people that are thinking co-vocational, bivocational. Um, in digital environments, it's probably closer to 75%. A large majority are bivocoval. I mean, just today I talked with a guy. He's like, yeah, I've got a, uh, a, a job on the side. I'm, I'm making great money. I'm not trying to to change it, but I would love to figure out how to do ministry in digital space. And, and, and for him, like he's not looking for discovery and assessment and, and project management and, and like a lot of the, the typical model that, that Stadia and planting organizations would, would give. He's like, I'm already doing it. I just, I just need some to talk to some people. He's like, I'm all alone. I don't really know what I'm doing. Can, can you connect me with some, some people that are, that are already, doing this and, and so like this bivocational model is much more like hey let's get you to plan a church in two months because it's digital is so experimental and things move so fast and they're they're as, trying to be as agile as can to learn but also being ready to pivot and shift as opposed to a lot of the you know the launch large models and things like that where it's so difficult to get going and, and so the the tension i would imagine between the fidgetal and the, and the digital only crowd, like, I think you've just scratched the surface. And, and, and the more that I think the digital onlys start to expand and, and the chasm between the physical, digital and, and the digital gets wider and wider, I think you're going to see more differences um, come up. Even in my own life, man, I, I just, I, I see, I'll, I'll start to have a conversation with somebody and, and, some some of my friends will say in the digital audience crowd, like some say that they'll say one thing. It's like I actually don't agree with you there, and and we can we can put a pin in talking at that later. But you know, I I I do think that you can do this in in digital space, and you don't have to have the physical. But um, what do I know? I'm I'm the seed of Satan, so it, it, it I probably won't work well for me. So what does the future look like? What does the church as, as we're spinning and, and, and heading towards next, do you have any other insight, you know, look, look into the, the future? What, what do you are? Have you gotten to the place? Let me ask this question. Have you gotten to the place where you have an expectation of what you're going to find in five years or is it still nebulous and, and, and you're, you're new? Have you hypothesized on this thing yet? You know, uh, when we look at the future, we think churches will function more seamlessly between physical and digital worlds, uh, and that the gospel is going to go viral, um, quite literally, not just figuratively, but uh, is going to go viral to the ends of the earth. Um, it's uh, going to be able to go into uh, the not just gospel closed uh, countries, but into closed family units into closed social units like gangs, things where it's dangerous to even put your foot in the door of a church, of a physical place, but where you can anonymously go in and hear the gospel in a place where you might never hear it before. So gospel closed families as well. I think that we're going to be able to uh, invade those places. Um, the, the church will be faithful to its mission of making disciples because we believe Jesus is building his church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And that means that there's, a, there's going to be that faithful ongoing mission of making disciples and they'll be committed to pathways of transformation that, um, for people to take place for individuals and for whole communities of people. Um, and when we think of communities, we won't just be thinking physical spaces. We'll start thinking digitally more and more. People will think of the, um, the gaming platforms as a whole community that they're, um, 
influencing for Christ. Um, it, it will be more uh, natural for us, more um, a way of thinking versus now. Uh, people look at you like you're crazy um, when you mention that God's really changing lives and people are getting saved in these digital churches and stuff. You really have to start telling these stories right away to, to help them believe that um, with real names <laughs> attached. Um, and that the the church is going to expand particularly. And as I said, gospel hostile. That's what I'd like to know, because that's a lot more than just closed countries, that there are so many gospel hostile places on planet Earth, and including in the U.S., uh, where you can um, invade those anonymously and provide safety for people to actually hear the gospel. And I think uh, when we look to the future, uh, we're very hopeful. Um, I, I'm going to leave... Um, I'm going to leave the negative predictions to some folks on YouTube. Um, we we look to the future, and we see this as a, a scattering uh, similar to the Reformation. There's some downsides. It's called uh, Protestants because they were protest protesting, and um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, much of the uh, movement forward in the kingdom through the gospel. Uh, in the last 500 years has been by people splintering. But we probably shouldn't be surprised because uh, in Acts chapter 8, that's exactly what it took for the gospel to get out of Jerusalem and finally to Judea and Samaria. Uh, now we're truly going to the ends of the earth. And as Anne mentioned, uh, this democratization of the gospel, um, when it is not bound by physical structures or ecclesiastical structures or uh, requirements, or licensure, or profession. Uh, all of those things serve us. And by the way, we participate personally in those. We're not iconoclasts in that regard. But, but technology is bringing us to reform the church because it is simply not going to those places to ask for permission. Uh, it is a scattering that is going to benefit the kingdom. The gospel is going to flow into every nook and cranny. Uh, the gospel is the power of, I'm preaching, the gospel is the power of God for salvation. As the gospel flows and shares through through all kinds of platforms and voices and streams, it is going to be effective in those places. And truly for those who anticipate that the return of the Lord will happen after the gospel has been heard to, in every person in every place, uh, this this has to be an exciting possibility that that eventuality could could actually happen quickly for us. So uh, we see uh, we see Jesus doing a beautiful thing in the church. Um, he's not afraid of technology. He has he has used it. We are using it. We are seeing people called to do that. We want to learn from them. Uh, we want to share that information with others that might benefit. And uh, we expect that churches are going to meet physically for a long, long time. I hope so. I plan to be there frequently. But we also know that the blending between physical and digital, as Ann mentioned, is going to become um, almost difficult to describe for future generations. And this is my little story. Our grandkids are uh, 7 to 12 years of age. And when I watch them with iPhones, I notice that these uh, Gen Alphas don't differentiate between the conversation we're having and the technology that they're engaging uh, there's a reason that there's no uh, frame around the iPhone uh, face. Uh, it is to give the impression of seamlessness. Uh, Ann and I are boomers. Trust me, there is a seam between technology and physicality for us. But as this generation is emerging, that in 20 years will be our leaders, they will have grown up in an environment that doesn't even think to ask the question, what's the difference between physical and digital space? It is the world that they live in. And as older members of the church and the kingdom, for us to, to be opening doors for what they are already experiencing in their, in their enculturation, so that as they grow in the next few years and receive callings and giftings from God, that, that some doors will already be opened for them to naturally move into, instead of being doorkeepers that close the doors on cultural norms, to be door openers that say, why don't you express yourself and the gifts God's given you and the environment that he chose for you to be born into. The church has a bright future. Love that. And, and, as, and as the metaverse, augmented reality, virtual reality, 
you know, continues to to blur that. I, I do. Th- I, I agree with you. I, I think it's going to be hard uh, to separate um, physical IRL and, and 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 meta and digital and all this. I think it's just going to all get blurred into to one thing. And, and for many people, that's a very very scary idea. They they just they can't reconcile that for for whatever reason. And, and so hopefully time will tell. Uh, to your point, though, I, I do think the pendulum is shifting, and, and I think the future generations are not going to have the issues and, and the hang-ups that maybe some of our current ones have. Well, hey, let's let's land a plane. Well, tell me what's next. Like, where's Sprout heading to? What what's next? So you're on a five year plan. What what is uh what is uh year two look like as you're doing the research? So year two, we want to do a global study of digital only church planters and their best practices across the discipleship pathway. Um, and um, just behind the scenes, we want to be the biggest cheerleaders in digital uh, space as well, um, because that that's one of the biggest challenges is just what you faced before we had our conversation today of people discouraging and saying negative things to you. We want to be those people in these, in these uh, digital planters lives that are cheering them upward and onward. Um, And one of the things we can do to help that happen is connect them together in a global network. And that will be one of the, the goals out of this, these research projects is building a digital community of uh, planters because talking to each other, they find they just like planters in the hard copy space. I mean, then the in-person space, you find you have similar things going on, similar struggles, but there's, you want also to be those external cheerleaders. And that's what we, we want to be champions, as you said, because that's more than cheerleading. We, that's where we want to invest. That's where we want to uh, give our attention to encouraging them. So that's, that's 2022, 2023 is, prototypes for digital plants that incorporate best practices that were identified in the various platforms. Just an initial uh, results of that, because obviously after five years, we'll have a lot more, but you don't want to wait for five years to reveal what you've, what's learned in each step of the way. So uh, if, if those prototypes, and we're differentiating prototypes from what's currently being done, uh, what we're hoping to do is to find the the best practices across the discipleship pathway. So l- let's use uh, Engel scale from a negative 13 to a positive five to describe uh, one of those models. So there's uh, in, in his model, um, it, there's uh, there's all these points along the way. So uh, we're finding the best practices uh, at points along the way. And the theory is that if we can kind of knit those together, that you can create a prototype and you can say, you know, in, in this space, if you do this that she's doing and that that he's doing and this that they're doing and put those together, you might think about actually launching a digital church with with this prototype in mind and see if God actually uses your church to find people far, far from God and produces these mature reproducing Christians. So that would be a prototype. Those prototypes then in the fourth year are tested. Our hope is then in the fifth year that we're actually able to see out of those prototypes some models emerge so that now ultimately we can answer this question that compels us. Given a digital planter's platform and target, what model or models has God effectively used to fulfill the whole discipleship pathway? Four years away. I, I I love it. I cannot wait. Literally cannot wait. Uh, well, well, I'm just trying to think all the things that are going to happen by, uh, by, by 2024. We get to go through another election, but your, your research is, is going to be the bright spot of, of what's going to be a very interesting year. I'm, I'm sure. Hey, so, so we're going to wrap. This is, this has been great. These, these are two of my favorite people. We said it earlier in, in, in the podcast, but love, the research they're doing and what they're contributing in this digital space. And, um, you know, we'll put some links in the show notes to get connected with them and some of the research that they're doing. So be sure to check that out. Uh, but we're, we're going to call it and, and we're, we're going to wrap. So, uh, for, for Jared, for Ann, this is Jeff at the church digital and with Stadia church planning. Thanks for, for jumping on the podcast. Team. We'll see you next time here on the show. You have a good day.